So welcome everybody. Um, we're just letting people uh, sign on and we'll be getting started in a few minutes. So welcome everybody and uh, welcome to our Queen's Global Oncology Live Critical Appraisal Masterclass. Uh, my name is Scott Berry. I'm a medical oncologist here at Queen's University. Uh, I'm the head of the Department of Oncology and the executive director of the Queen's Global Oncology Program. And we're very excited about today's live critical appraisal masterclass. Um, I'll be uh, introducing Dr. Giawali in a few minutes, uh, but just to let you know about our masterclass, um, this masterclass has a couple of components. One uh, is an online, uh, uh, online collection of lectures. Uh, with a very distinguished uh, international faculty, including Dr. Thawanka Wijaratni, Dr. Nazak Kamad, Dr. Pierre Ranganathan, who's joining us today and, and does the, uh, the core module on the randomized controlled trial, because this uh, uh, masterclass is focused on critically appraising uh, randomized clinical trials. Uh, Dr. Giawali has a, a session in this, Dr. Chris Booth, and Dr. Ian Tanik has two sessions to finish it off. This is available at the website uh, below and um, uh, it is a really outstanding set of lectures. Um, if you haven't had a chance to do it or look through them, um, I'd recommend it. Um, and uh, as I said, forms one component of our masterclass. The other important uh, component of our masterclass is the live component. And uh, uh, so we're very happy to welcome you today. Um, to, just to give you an idea of what's going to happen, Dr. Bashal Giawali, who I'll introduce in a few minutes, is going to re review a contemporary randomized clinical trial um, in an effort to demonstrate how to uh, apply the, the principles of critical appraisal that are outlined um, in, our, in our online masterclass and take those principles and make them real by reviewing them in a real uh, randomized clinical trial. And then we're gonna have some small group breakout sessions. Um, and uh, we have some expert faculty to help facilitate that from, uh, again, an inter international faculty, faculty of experts um, uh, in, in critical appraisal and uh, research methodology who are gonna help uh, facilitate discussion. And they'll be there to answer questions about D Dr. Giawali's uh, presentation, the specific trial he presented, or any other questions about critically appraising randomized clinical trials that you have. And here uh, uh, is the, um, our, uh, our small group facilitators. Very happy to welcome Dr. Joe Pater, Dr. Nazik Kamad, Dr. Fidel Rubagumia, Dr. Dorothy Lambe, Dr. Hannah Nayati, and Dr. Thewanka Rijaratni. And I'd like to thank Laura Carson, who's our global oncology uh, program manager, who uh, does just sterling work in making sure that both the online program and these live master cl classes are expertly coordinated. So thanks to Laura as well. So without further ado, um, I'd now like to introduce Dr. Bashal Giawali. Dr. Giawali is a medical oncologist and associate professor here in the Department of Oncology at Queens. Uh, and we're very fortunate to have him here as our keynote speaker in today's live masterclass in critical appraisal. Uh, thank you, Bashal. Looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Berry, for the kind introduction. It's my big pleasure to uh, sort of walk through a clinical trial publication today with the, with the audience um, for Queen's Global Oncology Program's masterclass in critical appraisal. Um, so I hope you can all see my slides. Yes, we can. Okay, so let me start. Uh, so as a background, um, many of the points that I'll be discussing today uh, are also covered in this paper. You can just Google this. Um, and if there is any confusion, you can refer to this paper as well. And also as a background, uh, we did a similar uh, live masterclass uh, uh, a few months ago, in which I covered a different paper. Uh, so I hope you have gone through that because some of the themes will be recurring and it would be easy to contrast these two papers. Uh, 
For example, the last paper I covered was a superiority trial, and today we'll be covering a non-inferiority trial. Uh, but if you have not gone through that, there is a link here, and you can go to this link and, and watch the previous lecture. So this is the paper that we'll be covering today. It's the circulating tumor DNA analysis guiding adjuvant therapy in stage two colon cancer. Um, I hope that you have gone through this paper once. This was published in the New England Journal of Medicine a couple of weeks ago and was presented at the ASCO annual meeting as well. So even before you start reading the paper, again, a few disclaimers that this is my approach and I can't say that this is necessarily the best approach, but this is how I read the paper. And I hope that sharing my experience will be useful to you to understand a clinical trial publication uh, in your context as well. So even before I start reading a paper, the first thing I look at is who funded the um, trial, who sponsored the trial, and is there any significant conflict of interest that I should watch out for while I'm reading the paper? And this is an important issue because these studies have consistently shown that uh, trials that are funded by the industry uh, have substantial bias in the way they report the trial. Uh, but for this paper, for example, this was supported by the Australian National Health and Medical Research Council. Uh, so it does not seem to have any industry funding here per se. And the same thing, you can also look, look into the trial oversight section of the methods. It says the trial was initiated by investigators based at the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute of Medical Research. So it does not seem to have any substantial industry funding here. Uh, for this trial and no one who is not an author contributed to writing the article. This is also important because if you compare this with the previous paper that I discussed a couple of months ago, it was a fully industry funded paper and medical writers were used to write that paper. Um, uh, and the other point to look at is the conflict of interest section, which is at the end of the paper. And again, here, it seems like uh, this was funded by um, not for profit organizations and there does not seem to be significant conflict here if you compare that with the previous paper that i presented of uh, the empower as uh, impasse 130 trial uh, this is just for contrasting it was funded by the company the trial is sponsored designed the trial interpreted the trial analyzed the trial and um, it was written by professional medical writers and some of the authors are employees of the company so this is the contrast and again, in the same trial oversight section, uh, as compared to our current uh, study, in this previous study, the industry was responsible for collection analysis and even the interpretation of the data. So this is something that you need, I, I usually look out to even before I start reading the paper. Okay, having gone through this, uh, the other question is, when do you read the abstract? So I think I have answered this question in my previous uh, lecture as well, but just to reiterate, I don't read the abstract first. I read the abstract once I have already read the paper for future reference, because first I want to read the whole paper and understand what the study is about. Then in the future, for example, you know, I have a patient in the clinic and the patient says, uh, doctor, what are my chances of uh, responding to this treatment? Or doctor, how much uh, survival time can I expect? Then at the time, you, of course, can't remember everything off the top of the, your head, but you will remember that, okay, uh, then you'll Google the, the trial and, you know, you'll see only the abstract um, and those important information are in the abstract. So when you already know what to look out for and when to look out for, at that time, you can read the abstract. But if you are reading a paper for the first time, I would suggest to avoid the abstract and just go into the paper. Okay, let's start with this dynamic trial, introduction. Introduction is the section that provides the rationale for the study. And, and it is an important section because you need to know why someone wanted to do this trial. And uh, as a background for this dynamic study, uh, for patients with colon cancer, stage two who have received surgery, the, the dilemma is whether or not to give them adjuvant chemo. And as they mentioned, surgery alone can cure more than 80% of these patients. So, uh, it's, it has double-edged uh, sword sort of thing because there are some patients who will not need adjuvant chemo and if we give them chemo, we'll be over-treating them and then there will be some patients who will relapse despite getting adjuvant chemo. Uh, so in a sense, we'll also be over-treating them. So they mentioned the rationale here that uh, the survival benefit by adjuvant chemotherapy is modest in this setting. 
Uh, and we need to be more precise in our decision making by limiting the treatment to high risk patients who are more likely to benefit and also sparing the patients who are at a low risk of relapse. Uh, we, uh, there is no point in treating them and we can spare them the physical and financial cost of treatment. So this sounds a very logical thing to do. We want to give chemo only to patients who are at a high risk of uh, benefiting and we want to avoid over treatment. We want to avoid the use of adjuvant chemo uh, for patients who don't need it. And so they say that this trial was designed to investigate whether a circulating tumor DNA guided approach as compared with a standard approach in stage two colon cancer could reduce the use of adjuvant treatment without compromising the risk of recurrence. So this is the key statement here. The whole purpose is to reduce over treatment, is to reduce the use of adjuvant treatment, but you just don't want to reduce chemo. You want to reduce chemo without compromising the efficacy. If you are not giving chemo and everybody is relapsing, then that's, then that's not good either. So this is the key point here. But to understand this in detail, we need to have some background of, uh, we need to have some oncological background, what's going on here. For example, this stage two colon cancer patients, as I said, we are not, uh, we do not have strong evidence about what to do with the adjuvant chemo. So there has been sort of consensus that we can separate them clinical pathologically into high risk and low risk. High risk means patients who are at a higher risk of the disease coming back. So the three most commonly used guidelines, ASCO, NCCN, and ESMO, uh, as you can see, they are, uh, they, are, they are congruent in two major risk factors, that is the T4 primary and less than 12 lymph node sample during surgery. Um, all of them consider them to be a high risk for the disease relapse. But then there are other factors that are not always consistent. And like ESMO divides them into major and minor factors. Some of us refer to as hard and soft risk factors. Um, and if you look at like tumor budding score, ASCO considers it, considers it to be a high risk, others don't. Positive margins, NCCN says it's high risk, others don't. Uh, high CA level, ESMO thinks it's a high risk, others don't. So there is no consistency here because there is no solid evidence. But safe to say that T4 and less than 12 lymph nodes, they are the most high risk factors here. But the problem is the whatever RCT evidence we have, in stage two, it's not for high risk and low risk patients separately. We have this evidence for all risk patients. And the trials and meta-analysis that we have, it suggests that the chances of overall survival benefit are very small. So it could even be non-existent. And if it exists, maximum at most, it will be 5% in terms of five-year overall survival uh, for all risk stage two patients. But the benefit in DFS is a little more consistent, but safe to say that the, this benefit is probably driven from high risk disease alone. And in fact, we have some studies that suggest that there will be detrimental effects by giving adjuvant chemo for low risk patients. And that is the reason why guidelines such as ASCO, they recommend against routine adjuvant chemo in low risk disease, because the chances of OS benefit are very marginal and DFS, it can even be detrimental. But the problem, as we just saw, is that high risk, the definition of high risk is inconsistent. Um, and even in high risk, we have newer problems, like should we use six months of treatment or only three months of treatment is enough, uh, as suggested by the IDEA group. And there is also the question of whether we should be using 5-FE as a single agent versus oxaliplatin containing doublet. So with this oncological knowledge background, we can move ahead with the trial methods. So this is the method section. And they say that they, they enroll patients with stage 2 disease, T3 or T4, um, colon or rectal cancer with negative resection margins. And of course, there are other usual eligibility criteria. The patient has to be fit enough to get chemo, good performance status. But when I look into this um, eligibility criteria of stage 2 patients, I'm a little disappointed because here it says stage two, it does not say stage two high risk only. So stage two means they are going to enroll all stage two patients irrespective of high risk or low risk. But as we have just seen in a previous slide, low risk patients, they probably don't do very well um, 
um, like they, they, they probably are overtreated with uh, adjuvant chemo. They probably don't even need chemo. But uh, in this trial, we're including all of them. And we'll discuss some more about it later. Uh, and moving on to the trial design, it says it was a phase two randomized controlled trial. And patients were randomly divided into two groups, which we'll discuss later, in two is to one ratio. So there are a couple of key points here to understand. One is this is a randomized phase two, and the other is the allocation ratio is two is to one. What do these things mean? First, let's talk about phase two randomized trial. It's, um, it's a little uh, tricky to understand, but I think it is important to understand because we are seeing more and more of these phase two randomized trials nowadays. So we used to have single arm phase two, and phase three randomized trials. And I think some people even believe that randomized trial and phase three are synonymous, but no, you can have randomization within phase two as well. And how does it differ? The first thing to understand is phase two randomized trial is not meant to replace phase three randomized trial. So phase two RCT is not a substitute for phase three RCT because the power calculations are different. The purpose of phase two is to better screen interventions in phase at phase two level, because we know that phase in phase three RCT, the chances of success are only 40%. That means 60% of our RCTs, phase three RCTs, they fail. And this is an outcome that we want to avoid. We don't want a failure in phase three because phase threes are larger, more intensive, more resources. So as much as we can, we want to have higher chances of success in phase three. And how do we do that? Uh, there have been several studies about it. How can we improve the odds of success in phase three? Uh, but one of the main uh, criteria is, uh, can we improve on phase two so that we take better interventions into phase three? So that's where the single arm phase two versus randomized phase two comes into play. Uh, because the problem is the interventions that we think are successful in phase two, they are failing in phase three. Uh, and that's why uh, will randomize phase two be a better design compared to single arm phase two for that purpose. And obviously the, pro the difference here is about selection bias. If we are doing single arm phase two, then there is no randomization. We just have one cohort of patients. So there is a huge selection bias there because we are selecting patients whom we think are very fit to get this new drug um, they are probably going to do well and they will not suffer some toxicity. So there is a huge selection bias there. By doing a randomized phase two, we try to allay that concerns. And the other thing is when you're doing a single arm phase two, how do you define success? You define success based on a historical comparison. For example, in, that, in a certain tumor type, you know that uh, based on the historical data that probably the response rate is 5%. And then you say, okay, with this new drug in the single arm phase two, if I see a response rate of more than 5%, then I'm happy. And I'll say that, okay, this is success and I'll take it to a phase three. So in a, in a sense, we are just trying to screen out very ineffective drugs in phase two. But in randomized phase two, we can test uh, the two hypotheses. Uh, in randomized trial, it's not about screening out ineffective drugs, but it's about screening in potentially effective drugs, because you also have a contemporary simultaneous control arm. So it's not about whether we are doing better than the historical comparison, but you can actually see how the intervention arm is doing compared to the control arm. So you can screen in potentially effective drugs. But unlike phase three, it's not powered enough to make uh, definitive conclusions. So this is about phase two randomized trials. And if you want to know more about it, there is obviously so much to talk about it. Uh, I would highly recommend going through these two papers. I, I think these two are one of the best papers written about randomized phase two trials. Um, and these papers will give you more insight about it. Uh, and But there is one paper that I want to uh, highlight the results of. This was published in uh, European Journal of Cancer, I think. Uh, comparison of treatment effect from randomized phase two and subsequent randomized phase three. Uh, we have seen comparison of effects from single arm phase two and randomized phase three, but this is randomized phase two versus randomized phase three, and the results are very interesting. There are very few occasions where we get both randomized phase two and randomized phase three for the same treatment in the same setting, and they collected those trials from the literature, 
And this is what they found. They plotted the hazard ratio for PFS and OS. Um, and if you look, this is the line of unity that passes through the origin. Most of the trials are above this line of unity. That means the hazard ratio is higher in phase three compared to phase two. Hazard ratio is higher means the treatment effect size is lower. That means even if they are both randomized trials, a phase two exaggerates the benefit. A phase two spuriously shows that the treatment is more beneficial than it actually is. And they conclude that PFS benefit was 26% larger in phase two versus phase three, and OS benefit was 27% larger in phase two than phase three. So whenever we are reading a randomized phase two trial, we need to keep in mind that whatever treatment effects by the benefits that we are seeing are probably falsely exaggerated uh, findings. Now, next is the uh, two is to one randomization thing. So usually in randomized trial, we see one is to one randomization. Uh, they are randomly equally allocated. If the allocation ratio is different, instead of one is to one, we are randomizing two is to one, like in this trial, the, the dynamic trial that we're discussing today, in which there was two is to one randomization. We call it unequal allocation ratio or unequal randomization. And the first thing is, why would anyone want to do two is to one or three is to one randomization instead of one is to one? And the answers we get is, one, uh, the, the, the trialist, they think that, uh, the, uh, the trial sponsor thinks that the intervention is really good and we want more patients to get this treatment. Uh, we want to minimize the number of patients who get randomized to control arm. We want more patients to get the, the intervention. That's why we do two is to one, three is to one randomization. And tied to that logic is another logic that says, we'll have faster patient recruitment because if the patients know that they have uh, greater chances of getting the new treatment, maybe more patients will sign up for therapy because one is to one randomization patient has 50, 50 chance of getting either the drug, the, the new intervention or the control treatment. With two is to one, the patient has a 67% chance of getting the new intervention. So we'll have faster recruitment. These are the two logic or, or reasons that people put forward to, to make a case for two is to one or three is to one randomization. But I think one is to one randomization is the best approach. I'll, I'll tell you why. I, I'll make a case against unequal randomization. So one is by having an allocation ratio of two is to one or three is to one instead of one is to one, you need a larger sample size. I'm, I'm hearing some, some echo and noises. Um, if you could kindly mute. Uh, yeah. So um, it has been shown that a two is two, as compared to one is to one randomization, a two is to one randomization requires 12% more patients. A three is to one requires 33% more patients. So that means you need more patients for the same effect size, to, to detect the same effect size with the same power. That means probably you are not completing your, tri your trial sooner. The fact that patient recruitment is faster and trial will complete sooner is probably not valid because you need more number of patients. So, you know, if you do not increase your sample size, then you will have less power. And if you increase your sample size, then it becomes more and more like it becomes a larger trial and it becomes more expensive, more resource intensive. Um, so uh, it's much better to go with one is to one randomization. And the other argument, and these two arguments are tied is that, uh, you know, if you think that patients uh, in the intervention arm will benefit and you want more patients to go to the intervention arm and you want to minimize the number of patients who get randomized to control arm, that's, that goes against the philosophy of randomized trial itself because you do a randomized trial because there is clinical equipoise. You do not know which arm is going to do better. That's why you run a trial. If you already know that the intervention arm is going to do better, what's the point of even doing the trial? There is no clinical equipoise. So two is to one, three is to one randomization it goes against the philosophy of randomization and trial. And we have seen several two is to one, three is to one randomized trials that have failed ultimately. 
So that means in those trials, we actually exposed more patients to this failed treatment than they would have been exposed if we had uh, stuck with the one is to one uh, allocation ratio. And finally, there is also the issue of validity of the, of the um, trial, because especially in double blind trial, the physicians, the patients, they are not aware of, uh, of what intervention they are allocated to. But if you are doing two is to one, three is to one randomization, then any patient is more likely to be getting your treatment than the placebo or, or the blinded treatment. So that violates the, the blinding gets eroded uh, with uh, unequal allocation ratio. And as I said, uh, there is actually no evidence that this increases recruitment and completes the trial faster. Again, this is just a brief summary of unequal allocation ratio. If you want to learn in detail about this, I highly recommend this, this publication. You can Google this. Um, but this is the summary for why I think two is to one or three is to one randomization is not a good idea and why I think one is to one randomization is the best approach. Anyway, moving back to our trial. So as we said, this is a phase two randomized trial, uh, two is to one ratio, and we discussed the pitfalls of that. So what were the two arms of the trial? One arm is the CT DNA guided management, and the other is the standard management. So one arm, they will have the disease managed according to the CT DNA results, and the other, they will be managed according to our usual criteria, um, how we have been treating these patients up until now. But again, as I mentioned, I'm not happy with this because this is not answering the question that they said they were going to answer. As we discussed in the introduction, this, the, the purpose of this study was to investigate whether using a CT DNA guided approach as you can read here, could reduce the use of adjuvant treatment without compromising the risk of recurrence. So they want to see whether they can de-escalate treatment, whether they can offer lesser number of patients this treatment. But by, by dividing them into CT-guided management and standard management and without segregating patients into low risk and high risk, I, I, I don't think this uh, method is going to answer the question because here, even low risk patients are going to get chemo, which is exact opposite of what they are trying to see. And we'll see that more in results as well. Now let's go to the endpoints. It says the primary efficacy endpoint is recurrence-free survival at two years. Okay, there are a number of things here to understand. Recurrence-free survival at two years. First, what is recurrence-free survival? First, what is, what is recurrence-free survival? Uh, we hear, we see all of these endpoints, but I think we need to understand them very well. Is recurrence-free survival the same as disease-free survival? What is disease-free survival? What is time to tumor recurrence? All of these concepts are important to understand. And sometimes even the same endpoints definition differs by tumor type. But in general, I think for colon cancer that we are discussing here today, this is a fantastic publication. And this table is one of the best tables on endpoints, on surrogate endpoints that I have seen, because this explains everything together uh, very neatly. So as we can see here, if we compare DFS versus RFS, the difference is that disease-free survival includes any second cancer as the event, but recurrence-free survival does not. And it makes intuitive sense. Like a patient with colon cancer, if that person develops breast cancer in the future, that is still a disease uh, like cancer. So it is included on the disease-free survival event, but that's not the recurrence of the same colon cancer. It's a different cancer. So it's not included on the recurrence-free survival. So that's basically the difference between disease-free survival and relapse, uh, recurrence-free survival. Recurrence-free survival and relapse-free survival, they are almost the same thing. They are, they are the same thing. But time to tumor recurrence, as you can see, it does not include uh, death from, uh, is, um, from other cancers as an event. Um, and time to and uh, these are time to treatment failure, cancer specific survival, and overall survival, uh, which we will not be discussing today. The other thing is we saw that the primary endpoint was recurrence free survival at two years. We saw what recurrence free survival means. But the second thing is this is a surrogate endpoint, of course, because this is not overall survival. The second thing is, is it a good surrogate? Now, surrogate validation studies are tricky and they have been done, but for the sake of surrogate studies, most of the studies, they put DFS and RFS together because there is not enough trial sample size 
to evaluate them separately. And probably there is very small difference between them. Uh, so they lump it together. So we can take it uh, as the same thing for the sake of trial validation, uh, surrogate validation. And from uh, this paper by Binay Prasad, uh, we see that for colon cancer, if you see row two, three, and four, for colon cancer, these are like early studies now done in 2005, 2008, but the adjuvant chemotherapy treatment has not changed. It's still 5-FU and oxaliplatin. Um, uh, you, we see that the strength of correlation is 0 0.94, 0 0.95, and this is pretty high. This is very good uh, correlation coefficient. Usually in, in oncology, we always uh, see that the surrogates are not good surrogates. These endpoints do not correlate with overall survival. But in colon cancer, we see that this it's pretty good surrogate. Uh, so yes, these are good surrogates for colon cancer. Mm, again, if you want to learn more about colorectal cancer surrogate endpoints, this is a paper that I would recommend. But there is a but. Although this is a good surrogate, the DFS itself is very tricky. Uh, from the NSABPC08 trial, this is the trial of Bevacizumab in the adjuvant setting, Falfox versus Falfox plus Bevacizumab, we see that the DFS itself behaves very weirdly in colon cancer. It's, it's very erratic. This is the black line. This is the um, DFS hazard ratio. Uh, forget about the minus signs. Uh, below, this is in log. Uh, the, below this uh, dotted line, it's beneficial. And ob above this dotted line, it's harmful. So this hazard ratio for DFS is beneficial up until 15 months, and then it becomes harmful. The same thing shown in kaplan meier graph, up until 15 months, uh, Bevacizumab is clearly beneficial. The hazard ratio is 0.6. But after 15 months time point, uh, the, the, the curves crisscross, and the hazard ratio becomes 1.2, and Bevacizumab is clearly harmful here. So yes, DFS seems to be a good surrogate, but when? At what time point? That is quite important. And as you can see from this trial, at 15 months, they crisscrossed. So in this trial, in the dynamic trial, the primary endpoint is two year of uh, RFS. Um, but it seems like we need more mature data on DFS to be confident about the surrogacy because DFS itself is behaving quite uh, erratically in colon cancer. So going back to our trial, it says the primary endpoint is RFS at two years, but I think we need more mature data at three years, five years to be more confident about the results uh, as we saw in the Bevacizumab trial. And a key secondary endpoint is, it is use of adjuvant chemo because they want to prove that you can uh, have lesser use of adjuvant chemo by using the CTDNA approach. And also one point to note, a side note, is that they mentioned that they would be testing CEA every three months for 24 months and every six months for 36 months and do a CT scan every six months for 24 months and then at 36 months. This is overkill. They are doing it in, in trial setting because they want to detect relapse early, but in clinical practice, we don't do it so frequently, as you all know. Let's go to statistical analysis. This is very interesting. So first, this is an, a non-inferiority design trial. And I think in our master class series, we don't talk about non-inferiority trials. And that's why I wanted to bring this up today. Um, our last uh, lecture was on superiority trial. Non-inferiority trials are tricky. The difference is in superiority trial, we are trying to test whether our newer intervention is better than what we already have. In non-inferiority trial, we are trying to test whether our newer intervention is not worse than what we already have. So we are, we are testing a different hypothesis here. We start with the hypothesis that it is worse and we try to prove that it is not worse. And for that, we need to define what worse means, how bad is bad. So that is the non-inferiority limit or definition or the criteria for non-inferiority. And ideally, what I have proposed in my papers is that we need to do a survey of the patients before running the trial and ask what level of worse outcomes uh, is worse or what level of worse outcome uh, they are uncomfortable with, but we don't do that in practice. Uh, we come with this non inferiority definition as a consensus among the, among the trial um, stakeholders. 
And here in this trial, they define non-inferiority as a difference in two-year RFS, the lower bound, as 8.5 percentage points. 8.5 percent in two years RFS. I'll tell you, this is mind-blowingly high. This is too lenient margin because we have seen that, and, and in fact, they, they write it in the methods itself, uh, why they chose 8.5 percent points to exclude the largest absolute benefit that could be derived from adjuvant oxaliplatin based chemotherapy for patients with stage two disease. So what that means is, the maximum possible benefit that you can expect from using adjuvant chemo in a patient with stage two colon cancer is 8.5% benefit in two year RFS. And by design, they are excluding that level of difference as non-inferior. This is really weird. Let me try to make it more clear. So what it is saying is, up to 8.5% difference is acceptable. When in fact, they're also saying that the maximum possible benefit you can get from adjuvant chemo is 8.5%. So in other words, like for the, like let's say one patient, one, one arm is getting adjuvant chemo and the other arm, the worst the other arm can do is not get chemo, right? There cannot be anything worse than that. So by definition, it is impossible to prove inferiority here. Everything will be non-inferior because we are excluding the maximum possible benefit as the definition. So it's, I would say that it's impossible to prove anything is inferior to that. Even without looking at the results, I'm going to say that, yes, this, this trial is going to prove non-inferiority. This trial is going to claim success. Okay, moving on. Uh, yeah, so they describes why they came up with uh, the sample size and the power calculation. And uh, they are testing a number of endpoints here. Uh, let me not go into detail there. I think we're already starting to run out of time, but let me describe you a little about non-infinity trials. Why, why, why does anyone want to do non-infinity trial? Non-infinity design trial is justified only if the new intervention is less burdensome, less expensive, less toxic and if it is associated with improved quality of life. Uh, doing a CTDNA test on top of your standard of care is not less burdensome, it's not less expensive. It might be less toxic and improve quality of life if we can have more patients avoid chemo, but we'll see about that. And the critical thing is non-infinity margin, as I have already discussed. Uh, and that's the problem with non-infinity design trials, that if your margin is too lenient, like in our case, then truly inferior interventions might seem non-inferior. I had done a review of non-inferior design trials, published this in JAMA Open in 2018. And at the time uh, in our review, we found that some of, like non-inferior can be designed in different ways. In our current trial, we're defining in terms of RFS rates. We can also define it in terms of hazard ratio and confidence interval for that. We found that the maximum definition of uh, non-inferiority at that time was 1.33, that means up to 33% increase in the hazard of dying was considered to be non-inferior. And I thought that was pretty egregious, but now I come across dynamic trial, which exceeds this. And after that, actually, the worst case of non-inferiority that I have ever seen myself is this trial. In this trial of Pazopaniv in sarcoma, they define non-inferiority as the upper limit of confidence interval for hazard ratio as less than 1.8. This is, this is worse than dynamic. This is almost doubling the risk of dying and saying that it is non-inferior. And the result was a hazard ratio of one, 95% confidence interval went up to 1.5 and they could still claim that it was non-inferior because 1.5 was less than 1.8. Going back to our trial. So what happened? Patient underwent randomization after uh, confirmation of the diagnosis and having week four bloody specimen, then Patients were randomized to two arms, the CT guided management arm and the standard arm in the CT management arm. Patients had to have their blood samples analyzed on week four and week seven. And if there was CT DNA seen on any of those samples, they would be considered CT DNA positive and they would get uh, five FU alone or five FU plus uh, oxaliplatin. And if the CT DNA was negative 
in both the samples, they would not get any adjuvant chemo. Uh, for the patients who are randomized to the standard of care arm, they would get chemo or not get chemo based on physician's discretion. And the primary uh, endpoint was assessed in the intention to treat population. This is, this is very crucial. Uh, sorry. Would it go? Yeah, it was assessed in the intention to treat population. And they also did a power protocol analysis. Let's talk about it for a while. What does that mean? ITT analysis versus power protocol analysis. Uh, I might be running a little out of time, but I think this is an important concept to understand. A hypothetical case. Let's say we are running a trial of adjuvant lung cancer. Let's say we have a new drug, drug X, and we are trying to do a trial of drug X versus best supportive care. Uh, randomized trial of adjuvant lung cancer. We are randomizing patients after the surgery. And after the surgery, let's say the patients are supposed to get uh, four cycles of uh, cisplatin uh, based chemotherapy anyway. So imagine a hypothetical scenario, lung cancer patients got surgery, we randomize them after the surgery, but they have to complete adjuvant chemo now. And after completing adjuvant chemo, they will be getting either one year of drug X, our new drug, or best supportive care. Let's say we randomize 2,000 2, patients. And this is the data that was shown to us. In the control arm, 1,000 patients, 600, uh, 610 died, 61% mortality. In the drug X arm of 300 patients, only 5% died. So eureka, eureka, uh, there is a substantial uh, mortality reduction, 61% minus 5%, 56% benefit in, in absolute mortality. But they showed this result and you thought, oh, they said there were 2,000 patients randomized. I see only 1,300 patients here, 1,000 patients in the control arm, 300 patients in the treatment arm. What happened? They said, oh, we did a poor protocol analysis because you know what? Uh, 700 patients after the surgery, they were not fit enough to get chemo. They could not get chemo. They could not complete four cycles of chemo. So they did not get our drug X. So they violated the protocol. So we excluded them. This is what poor protocol analysis is you treat patients according to the, you, you analyze patients according to the protocol. If they uh, followed the protocol, then you analyze them. Uh, otherwise you exclude them. And, but you, maybe you are the FDA and you said, no, I'm not happy with that. You need, you can't just uh, take away data from those 700 patients. We need to know what happened to those 700 patients that you excluded here, include them and show us a new result. And, the industry said, okay, fine. We included them and see. Now the mortality reduction is even better. Control arm patients, 71% died. Treatment arm is still 5% only died. So we are even better. And this is like, what happened? It was supposed to be 1,000, 1,000, but this is 300 and 1,700 patients. And you ask, what's going on? And they say, we did an as treated analysis because what happened is, these 700 patients who, cannot, who could not complete adjuvant chemo and did not get drug X, they just got best supportive care. So they did not get treated with our drug. So we first excluded those 700 in our power protocol. You said include them. So we included them in the control arm because they are like control group. They did not get our drug and they got best supportive care. But this is, this is a very bad way of analyzing data use in this is power protocol analysis and as treated analysis and these are the type of analysis that can be used to to fool the audience and so that your drug is so good um, what should be done is intention to treat analysis intention to treat means you start analyzing from the point of randomization after you have randomized it does not matter what happens to uh, these patients whether they get your drug whether they are not uh, fit enough what matters is you are at a crossroads and you want to make a decision, should I take path X or should I take path Y? And you want to see the results of that decision, not what happens subsequently. So intention to treat analysis, if you did an intention to treat analysis, thousand patients, a thousand patients based on randomization, then you will see that actually the mortality rate is the same. There is no mortality difference here. Even when the mortality rate is the same, if you do power protocol and as treated analysis, you can show substantial benefit there. 
So bottom line, intention to treat is the analysis, is the way to go. And the credit for this data and for this uh, numbers and for this uh, intention to treat and power protocol part of this presentation goes to Professor Daryl Francis. If you have not followed him on Twitter, I would highly recommend you to do so. He is a very, th very smart, thoughtful uh, cardiologist from Imperial College London. And he puts very important and insightful tweets uh, regularly. Um, and I think you'll learn a lot just by following him. Uh, so going back to our ITT versus power protocol, the gold standard is ITT, always stick with the ITT analysis because ITT reflects the effects of the decision to take path X versus path Y. It does not matter what happens subsequently, you want to know the results of a decision. And as I showed with that example, it prevents overestimation of treatment benefits. However, for non-infinity trials, there is a catch. For non-infinity trials, ITT may give false conclusion by proving non-inferiority of inferior interventions. Uh, if anyone can explain why, I would be happy to hear. Uh, but for the sake of time, I guess I'll just go ahead and we can discuss this later. So the thing is, what we are, why we are talking about ITT is we want to, uh, we do not want the non-adherence to affect our results. But in case of non-infinity trial, non-adherence is helpful to the agenda. What do I mean by that? Let's say there is intervention X, which is really good intervention, and you want to test intervention Y in a non-infinity design. You want to show that intervention Y is not worse than intervention X. So after randomization, if you know more than half of your patients in intervention Y, they cross over, they don't get your intervention uh, for some reason, they avoid that intervention, or they go to get X, then actually, if your intervention Y is harmful, we cannot see that harmful effects if we, uh, if we do ITT analysis. For that, we have to do a power protocol analysis. So for non-infinity trials, it is recommended to present both ITT and power protocol analysis. And that's what they are, have done in dynamic trial, which is a good thing. Again, this is a, uh, a complex topic to understand. So if you want to know more about it, I would highly recommend this paper. Uh, which is authored by uh, our faculties at uh, Queen's Global Oncology Program, uh, Dr. Ranganathan and Dr. C.S. Promise. Moving on to our study, they mentioned that they, they mentioned that they evaluated proportional hazards assumption, which is important because we saw with our bevacizumab trial that proportional hazards are not always met in adjuvant colon cancer trials. And the other thing here to note is no pre-specified plan was made to control for multiplicity of testing. So uh, except for the key endpoints, all other analysis that have been done, uh, we should consider them only hypothesis generating because the p-value was not controlled for that. Let's move on to results. <laughs> this is the console diagram, the most important part that you need to look carefully. And unfortunately, this is in the supplementary appendix. This is not in your main paper. One thing baffles me here, they randomized 455 patients, two is to one, 302 got CT arm, 153 got the standard arm, and then they excluded patients from ITT analysis for not having met inclusion criteria or, or blood sample and things like that. This is not actually ITT. ITT ana analysis starts at the point of randomization they are excluding patients after randomization in ITT analysis. This is, this is um, if there is any special reason for this, I don't know, but this is not the right approach. This is not your classical ITT analysis. You can't exclude patients after randomizing for ITT analysis. And even for poor protocol analysis, the reasons are, are so surprising. So, like patients who did not complete at least 24 months of surveillance imaging, they are, they are removing them from, for protocol analysis as well, because the intervention here is just the CT guided treatment versus standard treatment. So yeah, this, this poor protocol analysis and ITT analysis criteria, they look, uh, they, they do not look good to me. Now moving on to the results, table one. This is very interesting. One point I have not highlighted this here is the age group. 
uh, almost three quarters of the population seem to be young, less than 70. But more importantly, the, the parts that I have highlighted, first, let's see the tumor stage. 15%, only 15% of the patients are T4. We already discussed in the background that it's T4 and less than 12 lymph nodes that are like solid high risk factors. The rest of them are like soft high risk factors. But if you look at the solid high risk factors, patients with T4 are only 15%. And patients with less than 12 lymph nodes are only 4%, 5%. And if you aggregate this, like clinical risk group, high versus low, only 40% of the patients are high risk, 60% are low risk. So this 40%, I think, you know, usually some of our patients have multiple high risk factors. They are T4, they have less than 12 lymph nodes, or they have bowel obstruction, tumor perforation, lymphovascular invasion. But if you look at these high risk factors independently, the percentage is so low and the overall percent is 40, that means most of the patients here, one, obviously 60% of the patients are low risk, but even the 40% high risk patients, probably they are not like multiple high risk factors. They are like just one high risk, um, at most two high risk features present. So what I'm trying to get at is most of the patients in this trial are, are low risk patients, like 60% are classically low risk. And these are the patients that we would not have offered adjuvant chemotherapy to begin with. The whole purpose of the trial was to avoid the use of adjuvant chemotherapy if not needed. And here we are recruiting more than half of the patients who would not have required uh, chemotherapy by our classical risk uh, criteria itself. So the trial is not answering the question that it said it was going to answer. And now look at this, the adjuvant chemotherapy received in standard treatment arm, 28% of them got adjuvant chemotherapy. In CT guided arm, 15% of them got chemotherapy. So they said, oh, we, we met our secondary, uh, secondary objective that fewer percent of the patients, only 15% got chemotherapy as compared to 28% in the standard arm. But look at this, surprise, oxaliplatin-based doublet. Only 10% of the patients in standard arm got oxaliplatin containing duplet compared to 62% in the CT guided arm. That's mind blowing because what we are seeing here is exact opposite of what we are trying to achieve. Because when we say we want to avoid chemo for colon cancer patients, what we usually mean is we want to avoid oxaliplatin chemo. That leads to persistent neuropathy. That's the whole idea behind the idea trial that let's avoid oxaliplatin for six months. Here, the idea was that CT uh, DNA guided arm was going to get less chemo, and numerically it did only 15%, but most of them got oxaliplatin based doublet chemo. So, this is actually over treatment. Actually, CT DNA guided management arm got over treated more chemo than it was essential. So opposite to what um, people are claiming that this trial shows, I think this trial shows that by doing CTDNA, you overtreat your patients. You give them oxaliplatin containing doublet for, uh, for six months because you see that the CTDNA is positive and you feel scared and you want to give full chemo. And the other important thing to note here is median time from surgery to start of chemo. Uh, the other is the median treatment duration. It's 24 weeks. Uh, six months, as we already know from idea that we can give three months of treatment without losing much of efficacy. Again, that was a non inferiority design trial. Um, so patients are being overtreated here. But the other thing is, when did we start adjuvant chemo? In the standard arm, 53 days. In CTDNA arm, 83 days after surgery. 83 days is not acceptable. As we know, uh, after eight weeks of surgery, uh, the more we delay adjuvant chemo, the worse the outcomes are. And in fact, uh, this important systematic review uh, done by Dr. Biazi and Dr. Booth from our Queen's University, it proves that a four week increase in time to adjuvant chemo is associated with a significant decrease in both OS and DFS. Now, these are the main results. This is the uh, primary endpoint result. And as you can see, it's the two year RFS rate. This is the 8.5% is the non-inferiority limit. And at two years, this 
the shaded is the 95% confidence interval, it does not touch this limit. So people can claim that this is non-inferior, but still, if you see here, it is almost minus 5%. And if you go to 48 months, four years down the line, actually this confidence interval tosses and crosses minus 8.5. This is the Kaplan Meier graph for RFS. And again, the hazard ratio goes up to 1.82. And they saw the results for positive for the CTDNA group for positive uh, result versus negative result. And they saw that uh, they claim that, uh, oh, having a positive CTDNA is really bad. However, again, they have not adjusted for multiplicity. That is one thing, but the other thing is, as I showed, these patients are getting delay in getting chemotherapy. So how much of this is just because of the delay 83 days after surgery? Uh, because patients with negative CT DNA, they are not going to get chemo anyway. So delay does not matter, but for patients with positive CT DNA, that delay matters. And that might be the reason why they are, um, why, why their outcomes is, is uh, worse than, um, the negative DNA result patients, uh, partly. And again, these graphs you'll see only in the supplement. You won't see in the main, main uh, paper. The, they show the definition for non-inferiority margin. And as you can see, at two years, the absolute difference is favoring the CTDNA arm. But as we move on to three years, it's going towards the standard arm. Well, we don't know what will happen in four years, five years. And the time to tumor recurrence actually at three years, it does not satisfy the non-inferiority criteria. And interestingly, in the supplement, they provide detailed results for negative CTDNA patients with low risk and high risk. But for positive CTDNA, they do not give that risk category results. And I was very disappointed with that because I wanted to know if the patient has a positive CTDNA, but clinically low risk, will that patient still benefit? But that result is not given. Only, the only result uh, low versus high is for the negative CTDNA patients. And this is the subgroup analysis. There is nothing much to read here. The subgroups are mostly consistent, but just uh, uh, as a background on how to read subgroup analysis, I had uh, presented a couple of slides in my last lecture. So I would recommend you to go back to that to read about how to understand subgroup analysis. I do not have time for that today. Let me move on uh, to the discussion section. When do I read discussion? I read them after uh, reading the methods and the results. I do not read the discussion to, to get manipulated by what's written in the discussion. I, I read the discussion to discover the extent of bias. I make my own conclusions before reading the discussion and the conclusions. And sometimes I read the discussion in the hope of finding answers to some of the methodological questions. Like, you know, we saw that all patients or almost all patients got 24 weeks of chemo. Why not three months of chemo based on idea? And so answers to those questions might be there somewhere in the discussion. And actually there is. So they say that they use 24 weeks of chemo because the idea results were not uh, presented when they started the trial. And that makes sense. And the other thing is, as we mentioned, patients in the CT DNA arm, they, almost everyone got uh, full, like oxaliplatin containing chemo, which is uh, totally opposite of what we wanted. Um, and they explain saying that probably this is from the physician bias. They saw positive CT DNA and they thought, okay, this is bad prognosis. And they wanted to give doublet instead of a single agent. And they also mentioned that, uh, um, uh, yeah. So these are the type of explanations that we, that we can get from reading the discussion, uh, which is interesting to, to know. Um, but the interesting point here was that they do mention themselves that a better design would have been to randomly assign the CT DNA positive and the CT DNA negative patients to receive treatment or no treatment. And that trial would have provided definitive answer. So I wonder why they didn't do that. They, they knew that there was a better design, but for me, there is a still better design. Instead of randomly assigning, instead of doing CT DNA, what they are saying is let's do CT DNA, then positive will be randomized to treatment, no treatment, and negative will also be randomized to treatment, no treatment. I think that's a much better design than what they did. But uh, but an even more uh, better design, at least in my opinion, would be we are, if the whole purpose is to avoid adjuvant chemo over treatment, then low risk patients, they are not getting chemo anyway, uh, even by our current standards. 
So we'll take only the high risk patients and then randomize them to ctDNA versus no ctDNA uh, and tailor the treatment accordingly. Um, that would have been a better design, in my opinion, taking only the high risk group of patients. Anyways, the conclusion, the last paragraph of this trial, the conclusion statement says that the results of this trial suggest a survival benefit from adjuvant chemotherapy may be obtained in a well-defined subgroup of patients, blah, blah, blah. But I disagree with this conclusion. They see a survival benefit from adjuvant chemo. That has not been proven. They have not shown the OS results. And uh, even the um, RFS results, it's based on such a wide margin of non-inferiority, which is totally unacceptable. So no, this conclusion is not valid. This trial does not suggest a survival benefit from adjuvant chemo based on uh, ctDNA positivity. Uh, this conclusion is not supported by the data. And again, just to remind, they said the purpose of this trial was to uh, avoid patients from unnecessary chemotherapy. And the biggest benefit they would expect would be less than 5%. And even that was uncertain. So no, this trial does not prove any survival benefit. So verdict, uh, I'm almost towards the end. Um, what are my takeaways from this trial after reading this? So first, definitely this is not a game changer study. Uh, irrespective of what you read from the news outlets when this trial was presented at ASCO, no, this is not a game changer study. This does not change anything as of now. And because this is a randomized phase two trial, as we discussed earlier, the conclusion, the right conclusion from randomized phase two is always whether this should be worth, whether this is worth testing in a phase three or not. Um, randomized phase two alone should not be changing practice. But on top of that, this trial has very bad trial design and unacceptable non inferiority margin. And the question is, did it actually help avoid overtreatment? That was the whole premise behind the trial. And the answer is no, actually it led to more overtreatment. If uh, we saw CTDNA positivity, we are giving oxaliplatin to everyone. So it actually lead, might lead to overtreatment, uh, unlike what it was designed to investigate. And I also was thinking about what is precision medicine because the editorial, the news coverage, everyone was saying that, oh, CTDNA guided. We have now a precision tailored approach to adjuvant chemo, but what is precision medicine? Is it just anything we do based on CTDNA that is precision medicine? Because even now we are not treating our patients blindly. We have our clinical pathological risk criteria. We are saying this is low risk, this is high risk, and we are tailoring our treatment accordingly. That is also precision medicine, in my opinion. But there are several other questions that uh, remain to be answered. One is the internal and external validity of the test. Uh, is the ctDNA test, um, did it actually measure what it was supposed to measure? And can we replicate this uh, assay in, in, in other institutions? And the turnaround time, as, as we saw, is a problem. Uh, 83 days of waiting for chemo is not acceptable. And there is physician bias, as we discussed, in treating the patients with ctDNA positivity. And will these RFS results hold with longer follow-up? And most importantly, because we don't have the OS data, are we curing patients or are we just delaying recurrence? So again, I would strongly recommend you to um, check out our masterclass uh, website. And thank you. I'm happy to take questions or maybe in the breakout rooms. Thanks so much, Vishal. That was an absolutely outstanding talk. A very thorough, very insightful. And thanks for taking the time to prepare something that was so uh, valuable for our attendees today. We're going to get into the small room breakout sessions and um, we'll bring you back um, just before uh, we'll let you spend as much time in there as possible and bring you back um, in about half an, less than half an hour just to wrap things up. But enjoy the time in your small group sessions. Uh, I think you'll really enjoy discussing uh, with our expert facilitators. Hi, Scott. I have to leave, so I'll say goodbye now. Thanks, Joe. Okay. So welcome back, everybody. And uh, I just wanted to take a few minutes, uh, first of all, to thank um, our keynote speaker, Dr. Bashal Giawali. did a really fantastic job of going through a trial that was just presented at ASCO a few weeks ago and really giving a thorough analysis and, and really excellent guidance on how to go through a randomized clinical trial. Remember, there are online um, modules uh, that have more of this really type of, this, this uh, type of information that will help you um, go through a randomized clinical trial and appraise it effectively and help you integrate the information into your practice. 
I'd like to thank our expert facilitators. Um, we really think it's important to have the opportunity to ask questions in a small group, and that wouldn't be possible without our expert facilitators, and I'd like to thank them. And finally, I'd like to thank you for attending. Um, we hope you found it useful, and uh, please uh, stay in touch. Uh, we will be posting these uh, presentations on our website, and we'll promote that through social media, and we'll, we'll be having more live master classes in the future. We are working on subsequent master classes on biostatistics and initiating research projects. So stay tuned. Thank you, uh, everybody, and uh, have a great uh, day or evening. Thank you. Bye.